much for inviting us here and for hosting this uh, show. It's very nice. Um, also, congratulations to our fellow uh, First Prize uh, Public uh, Award winner. Um, and also to HS, um, HS Landscape Architects from the Netherlands. I'm sure that some of you might uh, know them. I think they also won a prize uh, here some years ago. Uh, since um, the project that we are going to present uh, was done by us initially and was later on taken over by them for the development and engineering until the final end. Uh, since we did the first part on the side of the client, then it became a tender and then they were in the team that won the tender. Um, so this proves that landscape architecture I think is a very slow and very long and very complex um, process. You can never do it alone and you always need um, alliances. So also this award is for HNS. Um, before I um, go into the project that uh, this is about, uh, I also want to cultivate a moment to tell a little bit about our office. Uh, as you mentioned, um, we have a quite special office. Because, but I'm sure that everybody here in the um, audience will say the same about theirs. Uh, but I will tell a bit about it anyway. Uh, this is a cross-section of our work of recent years. Uh, we work in uh, various fields within landscape architecture and urbanism, and that's the way we like it. We try to keep things as broad as possible. Uh, so you see uh, public space, uh, more green uh, spaces, but also uh, urbanism and um, rather uh, urban stuff. And uh, our office has a quite long history. I will go briefly uh, through it, but I think it's an, uh, an, it's an interesting story. Um, in 1977, um, Rick Bakker on the right and Anke Bleker on the left, they established uh, an office of their own, Bakker and Bleker. Uh, and it was in a time that landscape architecture, at least in the Netherlands, was uh, um, well fo mainly focusing on rather small green spaces design, or on the other end of the spectrum, very large landscape engineering with polders and dikes and the Flevoland, uh, for example. Uh, and they meant that um, they could actually also invade the urban area and to basically marry landscape architecture with urbanism and to go into the city. And I think that's uh, what we benefit from uh, still today. And uh, that ambition, um, well, landed, let's say, for the first time also with in international acclaim with the shared first prize for the Parc de la Villette competition in Paris, where we won uh, the shared first prize, again, a shared first prize, um, against or next to uh, Oma and Zahadit, I think, and uh, to me. Yeah, you also. You also. <laughs> there you go, it's a small world. Um, and after that, um, Bakker and Bleker, they uh, left the office and they actually left the opportunity to their employees uh, about the, the quest, how is this, go this office going to go further? And uh, those employees at that moment, they said, we're not going to pick a new director owner um, to continue, but we're going to move the shares of our company into a foundation and we're going to be also the board of the foundation ourselves. So it's basically a sort of collective and a self-governing uh, office, and that's the way it is, uh, remains uh, until the day of today. Uh, so we are a company, but I'm, for example, as the director in uh, the foundation uh, board, but also employees are in the foundation board, and we discuss and uh, um, decide on the continuation of our office together. And that also means that uh, throughout the years, different uh, generations of designers, led by different generations of directors, uh, have created a very big um, body of work. So, for example, this is um, the Kern Gezond in The Hague, a very large, uh, or the first uh, complete inner city plan of its kind, uh, led by Alle Hosper at that time. Later, uh, Kromhout Park in Tilburg. This is the time period of Michael van Gessel, and I believe that uh, Zaas, you're going to tell something about uh, him uh, later as well. Uh, then we moved on to a, a projects like uh, Wald Park in Potsdam, and a different generation worked on uh, the Arnhem Central Station. Uh, I was involved in this as, uh, as well. Um, 
And some years ago, two years ago, we had uh, a big party because it was our 40th anniversary and we invited all the employees, it was a list from over 250 uh, people, to come to our office and uh, to have a pool party, as you can see. And it was great. And um, the office today is actually continues this legacy. And we still, uh, uh, let's say, combine the um, history and also the knowledge that is present in our senior members in and around the office to younger, eager landscape architects and designers. Um, and together, we want to uh, work on interesting projects. And I want to uh, quickly show a couple of them. So we uh, focus our interest on, let's say, four focus points. Uh, first one is uh, the public realm. In this case, a public space in the city center of uh, Vienna. But uh, as this um, nomination or this award is also a public uh, award, we think that's, I think, something that we love. It's, um, we see public space or the public realm not only as a city thing, but as a very wide thing. So a bunker or a, um, a museal landscape can also be a public landscape. Urban transformations. This is a um, bridge that links a new part of the city to the old part of the city of Utrecht. It lands on a school and then it becomes a park. And there we try to uh, link this kind of very large scale infrastructure uh, that links two very uh, important parts of the city to a very small scale where it really becomes a place and a public space. Um, we try to look at um, urban nature or at least try to uh, understand and thereby to be able to use uh, urban, or oh, sorry, nat natural processes uh, and to bring them back to our environment. And this is, for example, a project, uh, Wijkerhoek Park, where we uh, picked up a lost stream, which was very fresh water on the one end, and directed it through a park on the other side, where we had a pond with, um, where we allowed brackish and saltish water in, and there we uh, organized this meeting of these two uh, water qualities, which um, as Martin said before, in, in the highly or, uh, organized and, uh, and uh, man-made landscape of the Netherlands is completely um, not there anymore, so we try to re-establish or re-integrate this um, type of ecology. And the last one would be uh, cultural memory. So that's, um, let's say, our take on heritage. Uh, this is a project in uh, Bocholt, where a former uh, textile factory is being transformed into a mixed-use area. So, for example, on the bottom right, you can see a part that used to be a textile factory that's completely um, uh, demolished. But, that, for example, we try to uh, pick crucial points in a sort of uh, search for uh, local uh, carriers for identity. We made sure that they be kept, and there will be the, um, uh, the starting point of this new urban development. Let's say to um, marry old and new into a new identity and a new reality. And the project that I'm going to tell a little bit further about, Objet Trophée, is um, interestingly enough fitting in all those four categories in a certain way. It started with um, the Beatrix locks. This is the, um, the building that you see in the middle. It's um, a monumental lock system uh, built in 1938, and it's a state and municipal monument. It has two lifting towers where it lifts the doors that regulate the water for the lock. But this lock was not big and wide enough anymore, so it had to be doubled. And that uh, was to, to be allowing ever bigger ships, state-of-the-art ships, that are inland shipping routes um, in the <coughs> Netherlands to pass this uh, structure. Uh, we were also involved in, uh, in this. We wrote the quality plan of how to integrate this very large uh, lock chamber to this monument. And we uh, said that it had to be very low, it had to be always underneath the ground level because the tower next to it is above ground level. And we said it had to be black instead of white of the towers to have a contradiction or a contrast between the two. And um, this was important because the Beatrix locks is actually the link, the crucial link between all the inland shipping routes on the north and all the inland shipping routes on the south. It's basically a cross or like a shortcut between uh, Rotterdam to Amsterdam and also towards uh, Antwerp. Here you see it in progress. 
Uh, and because the lock had to be widened, also the kennel that it lays in is, had also to be widened. It had actually to be double the size. So on the top you see uh, a relic of the old uh, course of the dike and also the new course of the dike. So it really becomes a new reality. This is when it was uh, nearly uh, nearing com completion. But there was only one um, uh, aspect that was a bit difficult because in this dike that had to be moved in order to widen the kennel, we found that there is the hidden bunkers of the Nieuwe Hollandse Waterlinie, the new Dutch defense line. The new Dutch defense line is a uh, defense line on the scale of the Netherlands, so running here it's depicted uh, between, uh, next to the uh, defense line of Amsterdam, which was first, then later it was uh, added and expanded with um, the new Dutch defense line that basically um, def defended all the left of the country from possible attacks from the east. And this defense line was completely um, based and constructed uh, based on uh, all the polders and the water levels that we have in the Netherlands, the heights of these different polders, because uh, the Netherlands looks flat, but within these polders there's always these height differences, um, and the dikes. So it's a, um, actually an invisible landscape, um, it was built in, in over a hundred years, so built and amended and developed, uh, and it was based on the green line, which is the dike, uh, the black dots, which are the bunkers that are, were defending the weaker points in the line, and the blue uh, fields, or the blue areas that are fields that were able to be flooded overnight. Uh, and this whole thing, which is uh, hundreds of kilometers long, was invisible in the landscape. And the idea of it was that uh, when the enemy would come, we would uh, open the gates, flood the fields, and there would be a flooded landscape of uh, about 40, 50 centimeters of water that is too deep for artillery or for um, uh, men on foot or horses to actually go through, but too shallow to um, invade by boats. So it's completely watertight, literally, until the moment that we invented planes, and then the whole thing was collapsing. Um, so this landscape, on a, the, the scale of the Netherlands, is a completely invisible landscape. It's a landscape in disguise. So this is our side, basically, or a portion of it. And there where the arrow is, that's where the bunker is. So they were, for camouflage reasons, of course, completely covered in soil and uh, meant to be uh, invisible. Also the fields and the landscapes uh, that were part of it, uh, well construction. For example, the farmers that owned the land, they were not allowed to know what, this, what the purpose was f of this whole operation, just to make it secret. Um, and our office was uh, some 15 years ago very interested in this uh, phenomenon. So we uh, did a research that ended up in a book um, called Versteende Ridders. And it's, uh, it's a bit hard to translate. It's got stoned knights. It's not because they were smoking, but uh, because they were, um, let's say, um, fossil fossilified um, waiters in the landscape. And this is what you can see when you walk around the landscape of Utrecht. Uh, these were the former inundation fields, of course, now in use uh, and ever in use by agriculture. Uh, and these bunkers are there. And we did an extensive research um, trying to identify every single concrete object of this line. And sometimes it was quite difficult because, uh, well, on the bottom they were completely overgrown. Uh, many of them are also packed in soil. We don't have pictures of that here. Um, and others are in disguise by, for example, a, a wooden shed. But we uh, mapped them all and we also put them into categories. So there's categories of um, um, bunkers that were for hiding, others were for artillery, and we put it all in maps. We made fact sheets out of that, drawings. And this was basically our background information. This was before the project that I'm uh, talking about uh, started. And maybe the most important thing was that we um, grouped them into clusters. So these uh, different groups of bunkers next to the inundation fields and the dikes, they, used, they worked together in groups. And uh, we basically uh, identified which groups worked together and which groups were separate. And the new Dutch defense line is currently in nomination for uh, UNESCO World Heritage. It's almost accepted, but it depends on the policy of the Dutch government 
uh, and the action taken in order to um, um, protect the line and to protect it from being lost. And for example, uh, of, uh, when we had to move this dike, of course these bunkers that are here and that are exactly in the center of the new Dutch defense line would need it to be moved or taken away. So that was the question to us. We, they asked us to develop a strategy, how to deal with this wicked problem in order to uh, let us build this new lock, which we need for economic development, but also remain the um, denomination of UNESCO World Heritage. And we had uh, extensive uh, talks with all the parties that had to um, uh, assess this. Uh, there were also a, a big um, a meeting, let's say, on a boat, on the canal, where we had all the parties together and we had a big uh, discussion. And in the end, we um, let ourselves be um, inspired by these images. These are images from the Atlantic Wall, also a defense wall, but then the other party built them towards the other way. Um, and because they were built in the dunes and natural processes let them be eroded, these mesmerizing images come across of bunkers that used to be very strong and that used to have the purpose of uh, shooting the enemy are now being slightly displaced and um, um, yeah, obtain or uh, gather a new sort of um, quality. It's almost uh, the quality of an art object, and that, of course, is in relation to uh, the ready-made movement. Uh, the Objet Trouvé, this is the fountain of uh, Marcel Duchamp, uh, which is still a fountain, but it's on top, it's tilted, and it's in a museum, so it's something completely different, but still a fountain. And that's exactly what we needed for our bunkers. So we proposed to take up the bunkers, carefully lay them aside, and um, tilt them slightly so that it's very visible that they are not um, ready to shoot anymore. But still, the line is intact. And therefore, we could treat this cluster 19 that we years before had identified in an exactly the same way. So the bunkers that you see on this line are all moved the 60 meters to the east, all tilted, and all became um, a museal landscape, let's say. So we visualized this concept. Um, we wrote rules about it, how it needed to be, and uh, that was the basis on, um, on which all the committees that had to assess it, they uh, said, okay, this is the strategy that we have to go for. This is another image that we made. And uh, that resulted into a quality plan, image quality plan, uh, that was put as a basis for the tender. The tender was won by a, a, a consortium, Sas van Vreeswijk, with HNS as the landscape architect of it, and they developed and uh, engineered the whole project um, into completion. And other than um, the bunkers of the Atlantic Wall that were displaced by the brutal force of nature, ours were displaced by the brutal force of this uh, heavy duty crane. It's a Mammut crane, it's a, um, a company that builds uh, heavy duty material usually for different purposes, but they can also apparently move anchors. So they were lifted, they have anchors on the top. In order to lift them, they had to um, put the anchors and cut the foundation. And even though the idea was to carefully lay them aside and let it be very relaxed and very all of a sudden, uh, of course our landscape on the left part of the country is all peaty and clayey and very mushy and, and not very solid. So we had to build this rather um, strong foundation to put the bunkers on to be able to, to make it seem very uh, all of a sudden. And there they went. So they were lifted and very slowly, very slowly moved to their new position. And this is the result. So there's a landscape that is uh, laying next to this new dike, next to the widened uh, canal. And all of a sudden there appear these objects, slightly tilted. And not only the bunkers were displaced, but all the objects that were part of this cluster. So also a sluice on the right, 
that was used to be very, uh, completely immersed in the dike body, but now is exposed. And also the thing on the left is um, um, an inlet work. That's a direct translation. But it's, it. it's meant to open the, uh, the shutter and let the water flow into the inundation field behind. And this is one of the bunkers. Laying next to the, um, the new dike in one of these inundation fields, which is now permanently inundated also for eco ecological and for uh, water management reasons. Uh, but therefore it also puts these objects in relation to uh, this reality that only twice happened, the inundation of the, um, the new Dutch defense line. And there's, there's all stories, of course, after uh, us putting the strategy out, um, the exact direction or the angle of til tiltedness it uh, was all engineered by h and It's uh, very uh, difficult. We were in um, uh, the quality team, so um, following this whole thing, but they did an immense body of work to uh, actually make it happen. And um, we are very happy with the result. And there it is. Showing its teeth. Thank you very much.